In this video, I'm gonna cover the Damn Vulnerable DeFi Challenge 13. Now, this is the version three that TinchoBait has just released. Um, so we're gonna cover the challenge. So let's get right into it. So let's read through the challenge. There's a contract that incentivizes users to deploy Gnosis safe wallets, re rewarding them with one DVT. It integrates with an upgradable authorization mechanism. This way it only allows developers, oh, sorry, deployers aka wards, are paid for specific deployments. Mind you, some parts of the system have been highly optimized by Anon CT gurus. The deployer contract only works the official safe factory at this address and the corresponding master copy at this address. Not sure how it's supposed to work though, those contracts haven't been deployed to this chain yet. In the meantime, it seems somebody has transferred 20 million DVT tokens to this contract, uh, this address here, which has been assigned to a ward in the authorization contract. Strange because this address is empty as well. Pass the challenge by obtaining all tokens held by the wallet deployer contract. Oh, and the 20 million DVT tokens too. Okay, so um, this is a cool challenge and I like it. So let's get right into it. Um, what I wanna do first is cover the actual contracts that we are given in this challenge. So the first one I'm gonna cover is this wallet deployer. So this acts as the contract that deploys the Gnosis safe wallets that then um, pays out the deployer if you meet certain conditions. So we can see it's called wallet deployer. We've got a Gnosis safe proxy factory at this hard coded address here. Um, and we can see it's this interface which basically meets this create proxy interface definition. We also have the copy or the master copy address, which was defined in the challenge description. Uh, the pay, which is how much each one's going to pay, the chief, the gem, and mum. Now, I do have a criticism about this um, challenge is that the variable names are a bit weird and wacky, but um, we'll just deal with it. So when this is deployed, we see that the gem is assigned to whatever is uh, passed in the construction. Uh, our first function that we have here is rule, uh, allows the chief to be set to an auth uh, set an authorizer contract and it'll be called once. So if the message.sender equals chief um, and this chief is equal to the message.sender when it's initially created, so that's the deployer, or mum equals zero or mum doesn't equal zero, one being the actual parameter function and one being the state um, parameter function, parameter uh, value and one being the state value uh, here. Then we set mum equal to mum. We also have drop, which is the function which will actually create the proxy and pay out if you meet the conditions. So it's going to call the factory address call create proxy uh, with the copy, the master copy address, whatever data that is provided in the parameter here. And if mum doesn't equal zero, and the message.sender can uh, and aim, uh, we'll kind of come to that, that's this function down here, uh, then revert, otherwise we've, we're good and we can go ahead and transfer that out. Then there's this big can function, um, which has been optimized by the gas optimizer. Um, so what this is doing is basically checking if you, the address of you and the address of A can perform this operation. And this actually uh, ties into the next contract. So we will get to this in a second, um, but this is essentially just some assembly which will call the authorizer upgradable function called, called can. Um, yeah, as I said, the naming in this is a bit confusing, um, but yeah, let's keep going. So then we have this authorizer upgradable uh, contract, which is also provided. Now in this case, this is what is set to in the wallet deployer contract as mum. So let's go back to the upgradable, uh, authorizer upgradable. So we can see it's initializable, which means uh, it has an initializer here and you can do um, some cool stuff with that. So it only gets initialized once. Ownable upgradable, so uh, it has an owner um, and upgradable, which is related to the UUPS upgradable, means it's following the UUPS proxy pattern, uh, which means that this can be upgraded, which is very useful to know. So in terms of state, we have some uh, mapping to a mapping to a number for an address and address to a number for wards. We have an event here. We have the init function, which takes in some wards and some other addresses, um, inits uh, whoever the owner is, which in this case will be message.sender. Also inits the upgradable. Um, and then the actual code here will go through each of the wards and then assign it to a uh, to the aims in 
the equivalent index in the array. And it goes through all of those and sets them into this wards array uh, by calling the rely function over here. And this is private, so we cannot call that. The rest of the function we have can. Now this function is actually what is being called in the wallet deployer over here in the can function here. It's just a, I don't know if this is misdirection of how to do it, but we will get back to it and how to do it. Um, but yeah, so it calls the can function, which basically checks if the wards, um, if these two addresses are allowed. So if the user and the aim map to one. We then have the upgrade to and call, which is overriding uh, the UUPS upgradable interface contract, uh, which will authorize an upgrade uh, to this particular address, but only the owner can do that. And then it will upgrade to and call this function with the data that's provided. Okay, so that's the contracts. Um, let's have a look at how this is actually implemented in the code here. So again, what we're gonna do uh, is for the setup, it's going to get some accounts. So we've got the deployer, the ward and the player. Uh, we're gonna deploy the damn valuable token. Um, so in the wallet deployer, that damn valuable token address is actually the gem. So we can see down here, we actually transfer from the damn valuable token in this case. We then deploy a proxy. So this is what we are saying before, the authorizer upgradable proxy. Um, so that will be deployed um, with the ward address and the deposit address. Now the deposit address is that special address which doesn't seem to be related to anything. And that was from the um, previous, uh, in, in the challenge description. Okay, so then we're gonna do some checks. I'm not gonna worry about that for now. Uh, deploy the safe deployer contract. So this is then gonna deploy the deployer um, and it's gonna deploy it with the token address. Um, so that's in the constructor. So as you can see here, that's gonna call this and set the token address there. Then it's gonna set the rule function to be the authorizer address. So we're gonna call rule here. Oh, sorry, wrong contract. And it's gonna call uh, from the deployer. So these will all pass. And it will set mum equal to mum, where mum is the authorizer upgradable. And then these are all just checks. We're going to then transfer 43 DVT tokens to the wallet deployer. And then it will ensure that that's all done. It will then transfer 20 million tokens to the deposit address. And then that's all the setup. And here are the here are the kind of requirements we need to make sure that we pass this challenge. Firstly, the factory address needs to have some code against it, i.e. it is a smart contract. If we have a look at it initially, it won't. The master copy will need to have uh, code behind it. So we need to look at that again. And as well, the deposit address will also need to have code behind it. So we'll have to think about that as well. Finally, we'll need to make sure that the token uh, balance of the deposit address is zero and the token balance of the wallet deployer address is zero and we, the player, must own all the tokens. Okay, so there's a lot of setup there. Um, let's go ahead and get started with the exploit. So the first thing, there's a, this, this challenge is a two-part exploit. It requires the uh, one, to essentially take over these addresses and the deposit address and also the address that is in the uh, master copy and um, proxy factory. Now, I'll cover this one first because I feel like this one is easier to grasp and then we will go through how to get part two, which is getting the 43 tokens from the wallet deployer. So in this, uh, section one, we're actually not going to touch the smart contracts that have been provided to us uh, from the challenge. We're just going to deal with these two addresses here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Etherscan and we're going to look up this address. Now, the reason we look up this address is because we know that this is the official safe factory at this address and the corresponding master copy at this address. So when we have a look at this, we can see that one, this is the master copy of uh, Gnosis Safe version 1.1.1. And when we have a look at the creation of this, uh, we can see that this was created by a wallet and it was the very first, wait, 
Yes. So it was the very first transaction that was created by this wallet, the Create Gnosis Safe. And so what this means is we can have a look at this transaction and we can view the, oh, here it is over here, the raw transaction hex. And because we're working from a different chain, so this was deployed on the Ethereum mainnet, because we can actually copy this entire thing and put it into our own code, we can actually replay this transaction. And because this is already signed by the uh, wallet that deployed this, the deployer of this um, Gnosis Safe Master copy, we can just copy this entirely into our code and deploy it on our own chain. Now, the reason that this works and you'd be like, whoa, that sounds bad. Yeah, it is pretty bad is because it doesn't have um, EIP, I think it's 155 uh, uh, replay protection where the transaction is signed with the chain ID built into the uh, transaction itself. And so in that case, you can't replay the, uh, the transaction, but in this case we can. So what I'm gonna do is copy all this transaction hex for this. And if we look up the same thing for the previous uh, transaction address for the proxy, which is this one, here, we'll actually notice that that is the third transaction from the safe, uh, the same deploying wallet. So if we go here, view all transactions, we can see that create proxy factory is the third one. So what we actually need to do is replay three different transactions. This one, this second one, because we need to, the nonce to increase by one, and then the third one, and then that way we will be able to um, deploy a proxy at the specific address. Now you may be thinking, well, wait, this doesn't really help us. How do we get the exact, when we create the contract, the contract's created at a random address. Well, not quite because the contract address is deterministic and it is a function of the deploying wallet or like the message.sender and the nonce. And so in this case, the message.sender is gonna be the same because we're just replaying the exact same transaction and the nonce is also gonna be the same. So because they're both the same, it's gonna result at the same contract address. So let's go ahead and get started and print out our first uh, replay. Where am I? Whoa, there we go. So let's go and paste in the first part of the solution and let's walk through it. So I've just got a helper function here, which will print the player token balance so we can see how it goes through. Um, we've also got a data uh, requirement here. So I'm gonna paste this in as well here. Now this data.json is essentially just a JSON blob of this entire, uh, of those three transactions. So we've got the deploy safe transaction, just the random transaction that was the second one with the nonce of one, and then the, the Blech, the deploy factory transaction, and then also the replay deploy address. So this is the address that is actually performing the, the deployments. And the reason we need to know that is because we need to fund it such that it has ETH to actually do the deployments in the transaction. So we're gonna firstly require this data. Uh, then we're going to connect to the wallet deployer and to the authorizer uh, as the player itself. We're then gonna transfer funds to the deploying address, which is that replay deploy address I mentioned earlier. I'm just gonna give it one ETH because it should be fine. We're then gonna send that transaction over. Then we're gonna go ahead and replay the safe deploy transaction with the same data. So the way that we do that is just we provide this transaction data straight to the ethers provider and deploy it. Then once we've done that, we grab the contract address from there and we should be able to see that this matches the contract address that's in the wallet deployer. Then we do that the same thing, but with nonce one, we don't need to worry about what this does, but we just need to know that it's done. Then we do it again, but with nonce two, we get the deploy factory transaction, get the contract address, and then we can see that we've replayed that um, factory. So let's go ahead and run this and make sure that they're deploying at the correct uh, places. So, ooh, log is not defined, I see. I have a, a little helper as well that I'm, I forgot to put in. Console log equals console.log. I just like it, so I don't have to keep writing console. So we'll run this 
And we can see that the player address is this. Replayed the master safe copy at that address and the safe factory at that address. We can see that's 345F, 769B. We'll go over here, 345F, 769B. Cool, okay. So now that we've got those um, uh, deployed, we can actually, we've already passed these two requirements for the success, so that's cool. So the next thing that we need to do is find, uh, get code at the deposit address. Now the deposit address, if you look that up, it's it might be something, it might not, I haven't actually done it. Um, but the way that this is meant to be done is you need to deploy some uh, proxies or some Gnosis safes. So because we have a fixed um, address that the, the, tr the proxy factory will deploy more proxies from, and the nonce is gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up, we can kind of assume, and again, with the name of the challenge being wallet mining, that a proxy that it creates may or may not be uh, the one that we're looking for. So it's a little bit of a jump, um, but that's just kind of how we go from there. So what we're gonna do is we are going to go ahead and connect to the proxy factory. And let's copy all of this. Okay. So uh, we've replayed it. So we're now gonna connect to the proxy factory at the Gnosis Safe proxy factory. We're gonna create this interface uh, helper function, which will just create interfaces for us. So we don't have to keep doing it. Um, and this is the Gnosis Safe ABI. So we can interact with the Gnosis Safe once it's um, ready or the proxy. Uh, contract which connects to the implementation master copy and we're just going to create this one which calls setup and this is similar to the previous challenges where you have no to say setup so I'm not going to cover this too much but you have the owner the threshold some other uh, stuff which are all just set to zero so it doesn't really matter um, but yeah so this is all the stuff that you need to set up to actually create a new proxy um, we need to find out now how many addresses we need to create or how many new proxy addresses we need to create before we get that um, missing it, that specific missing deposit address. So we just have a simple while loop here that will go through um, the nonces. So this is actually not creating any um, pro proxies itself. It's just seeing which ones we need by using the ether utils create contract address. Again, it's deterministic based on the uh, message.sender or the from and the nonce. So we're just looping through that. And after that, we basically will find out that we need to deploy 44 proxies to get to this deposit address. So um, again, we can kind of run this and we should see it's about 44 proxies. Yep, so we've redeployed it and cool. Why is that not printing here? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, okay, cool. So now once we've done that, uh, we can go ahead and create a transfer. So because we've now created 44 proxies and one of those proxies, like the one with the 43rd um, nonce, now is owned by the player. So we own the contract that is at address of the deposit address. So what we can do is go ahead and actually submit an exec transaction to the Gnosis safe so that we can transfer all those tokens from that contract address to the player address. So let's go ahead and do the rest of this. So we can go back up here. And firstly, we're gonna create the token interface for the exec transaction. So we need to create that ABI data. So transfer to an amount, we're gonna create the interface for transfer and we're gonna provide uh, the player address and the deposit token amount. Um, so now we need to create an exec transaction as I mentioned before. So the way that Gnosis Safe exec transactions work is you provide all the data in the call and then you also provide a signed transaction of that all that data that you've provided um, and then you pass it again back to the Gnosis Safe and it executes it if it all meets um, the requirements. Now, Gnosis Safe has specific requirements of how the signature should be formatted, especially for multi because it is a multi-sig wallet. Um, it can support multiple signatures, but in this case, we only need just one because there's only one owner, it's just us. Um, and there's a little trick that you need to do with that. 
So let's have a look at uh, the Gnosis safe. Uh, we're going to test that we're connected. So we get the contract at the deposit address, which is the one that we just created through the um, deployments. We just want to check that we're actually connected. Then for the parameters for the exact transaction, what we want to do here is basically there's a two um, actually, let's go ahead and take a look at the Gnosis safe itself, uh, the contract. So because it's 1.1.1, we're going to need to have a look at that specific version. So we can go to the Gnosis safe uh, GitHub here, look at 1.1.1 tags, go to the contracts and let's have a look at the Gnosis safe. Uh, contract here. So we've got all this kind of stuff here, the setup, which is what we did before. So this is the interesting one, exec transaction. So there's the two, the value, the call data, the operation. Now the operation is either a delegate call or a regular call. In this case, we want a regular call because we want to call the token contract. We don't want to do it in the context of the uh, Gnosis safe proxy. Um, the gas, the base gas, gas price, gas token, refund for receiver. We don't need to worry about that, um, but signatures we definitely do. So that's where all that details come in here. Um, and then it goes ahead, encodes the transaction data, increases the nonce, and then checks the signatures uh, all works. Now, what I'm doing here is adding an extra thing here, uh, extra parameter of zero, which is the nonce. And the reason we need that is because we need the get transaction hash. So that one is down here. Now, this will create the transaction hash um, for all the data that you're wanting to send. Um, so this is so we can get that hash back, sign it, and then send it back again. So the first thing we need to do is get the transaction hash. Then we want to sign the message. Now, a key thing to note here is that when you sign a message in uh, using Ethers JS, like we are here, it'll prefix it with the Ethereum sign message header um, with a few special bytes around it. The reason being is so that you can't, uh, when you sign a message, you're not just signing any message, like this is specifically for Ethereum um, and you can't accidentally sign transactions and stuff like that. So it's a safe, uh, thing here. You also will need to arrayify the transaction hash that comes back from this call. The reason being that it's a string and not an array of bytes. And so when you sign this message, it'll sign the string of the actual transaction hash as opposed to the hex value of the transaction hash. The next thing that we need to do is increase the V by four. And the reason that we do that is explained in the Gnosis signature docs, but I'm just going to show it to you here. Um, when we have uh, I'll also need to explain what the V is. When you sign a transaction, there are three main components of the sign. Um, it's called a elliptic curve di digital signature algorithm, ECDSA. Um, and there's three, there's V, which is a number, R and S. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but just know that those things are the three components of it. And so when you sign a message, you get 66 bytes worth of data, or 65, 65 bytes worth of data, 232 bytes in one byte. Um, the R and S are the first two and V at the, is at the end, which tells you what type of signature it is. Um, in this case, all we need to know is that V is going to be uh, 27 or 28 when you sign a message. But to indicate that to Gnosis safe, we need to manually increase V by four. And the reason that we need to do that is because of that Ethereum sign message prefix. So you can see here, that to support ETH sign and similar, we need to adjust V and hash that message hash with the Ethereum message prefix before applying eRecover. So eRecover will be able to recover the public key or the public address of whatever wallet or address sign that message. So when we increase V by four, which you will see again in the Gnosis signature docs, you'll just need to look that up on Google, um, then it'll go through essentially this branch of the code. It'll e-recover, but with the Ethereum sign message um, up as a part of that hash and then recover the correct address. I had a lot of issues with this. I kept on going down this side without realizing I needed to increase V by four, but um, that is why you need to do that. So first, so then you increase V by four. I did that by just converting it to a big number, adding four and then uh, converting it back to a hex string. 
Then from there, we execute the signed transaction to transfer all the tokens to the player address. So essentially all I'm doing here is passing in these transactions except for the last one, hence the slice, and then passing in the signature uh, that I've created before. So once we've done that, um, we should see that we now have all 20 million tokens that were initially given to the deposit address. Yay. Play address is 20 million. So you can see we've got all the stuff that's coming through here as well. Okay, part two of this solution um, is actually requiring having a look at these two contracts. So uh, you remember this all from before, hopefully, otherwise go back and watch it. Um, but let's have a look. So we've got the wallet deployer here. Where is the, uh, the error, right? So we kind of can work backwards. So if we have a look at the drop function, this is where we want to get the transfer. We firstly will need to create the proxy. So we can do that because now we do have control over that address and we do uh, have the Gnosis proxy or Gnosis uh, proxy factory uh, at that address. So that's fine, we can create a proxy the next check will ask if mum is equal to zero. We haven't changed mum. We only can do that through rule, um, but we can't do that. So that's going to be fine. And then it's going to call this can function. Now the can function will call here. And this is where I want to jump to. Uh, actually, no, not right now. Never mind. Stop. <laughs> okay. So. Um, this is going to basically uh, is a whole lot of code which will call the authorizer upgradable can function. Now, the first part of understanding what is going wrong here or where the exploit is, is that this is a proxy and it doesn't really need to be a proxy. So that kind of got me thinking of like, okay, is there any issues or kind of main things that could go wrong with the proxy? And I kind of thought around, I, I looked up kind of UU, UUPS upgradable issues and found a article around not allowing initialization on your implementation. So uh, what I mean by that, you see have, how there's this init function and this init function can only be called once, hence the initializer. And once it does that, it sets the owner, it sets the proxy stuff and it sets the wards and all that kind of stuff. Now. When this is called, this is actually called, again, if we have a look at the starting uh, setup, this is called at, where is init? Here, when the proxy is deployed. So again, how a proxy works, and I've got a little Excalibur draw for this here. The way the proxy works is we have the wallet deployer, which is pointing to the proxy, and the proxy has very little code and only stores state. The proxy then points to the implementation of that proxy for logic and all kind of yeah logic around what to do. Whereas the proxy itself here only stores state, this stores the logic. So if this stores the logic and it is a contract itself, can we not call init on the implementation contract? And it turns out we can because they're two separate contracts. Right? We're calling init on the proxy contract or the deployer is calling init on the proxy contract. But the we what hasn't been done is calling init on the implementation contract. Now, there is a way to bypass this when you are doing a, de a deployment of a proxy. Um, and by bypass, I mean like kind of patch this as an issue is that in the constructor, you dis disable initializers. Um, but in this case, this isn't here. So when we call init on the implementation contract, we will become the owner of the implementation contract. Okay, cool. And we can also set the wards and the aims. Okay, cool. That's nice. So does that help us? Do we win? Do we just set wards to be our user and aims to be whatever proxy that we've created or something like that? Well, no, not really. Because again, the wallet deployer is pointing to the proxy and using the proxy state. Whereas the proxy state is not, sorry, the implementation state is not being used at all anywhere in the kind of um, exploit path or the wallet deployer or anything like that. So if we control the state here, that's really not that helpful. What 
does, what would be helpful is if we can control the logic here, because if the logic here is changed, then that will change the logic of the proxy, which then may impact what the wallet deployer may do or not do. But the problem is with that is that the contracts or smart contracts on Ethereum are immutable, so you can't change them, except for one thing, you can delete them and you can delete them through self-destruct. And self-destruct is a call which essentially does exactly that. It removes all the bytecode for the contract at that address. So how will that help us? Well, if you come down here to our my magical second drawing, we have the wallet deployer, the UUPS proxy, which then calls an empty contract, right? How would that even look? And also, how are we going to even do that? Well, let's have a look into that now. So now what we're going to do is call the init function on the implementation. We become the owner through ownable init. And then what we have a look at is these two things down here, upgrade to and call and authorize upgrade. Now, authorize upgrade will firstly call here and make sure that we're the owner. Yep, that's fine. We've done that. We are the owner because we called init. The next thing that's going to happen is going to, it's going to call upgrade to and call UUPS. Now, when that happens, it's going to try and upgrade to the new implementation, even though this is already the implementation itself, with that address, with that data, and it's going to delegate call it as well because it thinks it's a, the proxy contract. So when that happens, we can create a new contract that it calls with the self-destruct call in it. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing that we're going to do is create the kind of helper contract um, that will allow us to do this. So let's go to player contracts, create a new file called attack wallet miner.sol. And I'm going to, is it miner or mining? I think it's mining. That's better. Paste in this contract. Now, don't worry about this. This is just an explanation for later. Um, but all we're going to do is create a function called test and it's going to self-destruct with a payable address to zero. So all the funds will go to nothing, even though there's no funds in it. We're also going to need this proxable, proxyable UUID. And the reason that we need to do that is that if we follow this function here, when uh, we try to call this, it will first check that the slot equals this implementation slot. And what the slot is, is a proxyable, upgradable, proxyable UUID. And so that is basically saying, um, can you please return the implementation slot for where you store the address of the implementation contract? So that needs to be the same as the implementation slot, which is this one, which is de um, defined in the EIP 1967. So in our attack contract here, we need to do that there. And we're also gonna have that self-destruct function there. So let's put some code in. Um, so from here, we're going to copy all of this. And go to our JavaScript and paste it in. Okay, so First thing that we're going to do is this implement get this implementation slot and firstly find the implementation address of the proxy. So we only have access to the proxy address at the moment. We don't have the implementation address. So the way that we do that is we get the storage. We use the ethers provider to get the storage at the attack authorizer at the implementation slot. We then get the last 40 because that's going to give us a full 32 bytes. We only just want a couple of bytes, um, which I think is 20 bytes. Yeah, 20 bytes for the address. So that's gonna be the last 20. And then we're just gonna flip on the zero uh, X at the start to make it a hex string. We're then gonna to connect to the implementation contract uh, through ethers, right? At that implementation address. We're then gonna deploy our attacking contract by you know just deploying it, pretty standard thing there. Gonna create the ABI to call the test function. And again, that test function will just self-destruct. We're then going to initialize the contract, like I said before, but we're not going to pass in anything here because the state doesn't matter. And then we're going to call upgrade to and call attack contract address. And then that will go ahead and call our function and self-destruct. Now you may be thinking, how does this actually help us? We've just destroyed the implementation contract, right? Let's go back here. 
we've got here, this is going to call that and that's going to cause issues. But this doesn't help us make that can call or does it? And this is where this kind of comes in a little bit. And we go back to the um, uh, assembly here. So this is in the wallet deployer, right? So when we call can here, this will call this. Um, what I've done here is just added labels at each kind of line so I can explain what happens at each line in assembly. And now there's a few things that um, are quite tricky here that took me a little while to get. So the first thing you need to know is it loads M, um, which is at slot zero. So slot load zero. Now, if we go to wallet deployer, we'll see what that is. Now, a slot is one that isn't immutable or constant. Um, it actually is a dynamic variable that can change. And so you can see that's constant, constant, immutable, immutable, immutable. Public, uh, that's the first slot. So address public mum. And mum is the authorizer upgrader. Okay, good to know. Um, ensure M has code size. So um, ext code size is going to check the code, uh, like kind of like the bytes or the number of bytes at that address. And the address is the authorizer upgrader. That is going to be the proxy. Um, if it's zero, return zero, zero. One thing that I learned in this is that the return keyword in assembly will not just return from the function, but it'll return the whole uh, transaction. So everything in the transaction will return after this. So it's not gonna pop back to here uh, or pop back to the, uh, the drop function. It's just gonna return straight away and not run anything else. So it stops executing. So it's good to know. So if there is nothing at um, the authorizer, then it's gonna return zero, zero, and we don't get the stuff. So that's not good. So essentially we need to bypass these three return cases. Then what we do is we let p equal m load at uh, hex 40. Um, hex 40 in the Ethereum virtual machine is the free memory address or pointer to the free memory address. So that's how we know where the next um, free memory address that we can write to is. From there, we then store at hex 40 p plus 44 bytes. The reason being is we're going to write 44 bytes at the memory address. So we're gonna store um, uh, the next memory pointer after that to be the free memory pointer. Then what we're going to do is store at P at that free memory pointer initially, uh, this value here shifted left this many bytes. And the reason that we need to do that is because we're basically storing the SIG hash for this function. So when we store it initially, it's going to look something like 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 453C4EB, right? What we want to do is actually store it there. Again, we're just creating the function data that will be able to call the can function. So the function signatures at the start here, so that's why we're storing it here. And that's gonna take up four bytes. From there, we're going to then store u at p plus four bytes. Because again, we've written already four bytes, we wanna move across to our new pointer and write the new address there. Then what we're gonna do is after 24 bytes, so p plus 24, so we've done four bytes for the signature hash, we've done 20 bytes for the first address parameter, we're then gonna write the next address parameter um, at p plus 24. And then what we're gonna do is, well, before I get to this, this is where we're here. So this is what p looks like now, essentially. p start, you have the signature hash, p plus four, the first address, p plus 24, the other address. And so again, this is all so we can call this can function. And so this is the sig hash of this can function, and then these two um, parameters. The next thing that we're gonna do is a static call to uh, the, this function on at this address. So static call works by providing the gas required, which is gonna estimate the gas. It's gonna call the address as the second parameter. So M, which is the authorizer upgrader, which again, to keep in mind is the proxy. The in data is going to be from P read 44 bytes, right? So we're going to, this is what data we're gonna kind of pass to it. And then the out data is whatever data we get back, we're going to write from P from zero to 20. So one, yeah. 
When we do the static call, we're going to check if it was a success or not. So static call, delegate call, call in Yule or assembly will return either one or a zero. A zero means there was an error. One means it was success. So it's checking, is it a zero? Okay, if there was an error, then return nothing and nothing happens from there. We don't want to happen. So when we do a static call to the proxy, the proxy is gonna do a delegate call to the um, function if, and then that comes back. And because the proxy itself does a delegate call and it itself checks if it was success or not. The thing is when you do a static call or any call at this low level, it doesn't check for function existence. So when it calls it, it goes, oh, it's not there. Is there a fallback function? No, okay, cool. That was fine, success, no worries. If there wasn't a revert, then it's deemed as a success. Therefore, because our function doesn't exist, it's deemed a success. So we pass this check as well because is zero is false. Finally, we come back here and it wants to check if there's an and, so it's these two separate things here. Firstly, when we load P, which is going to be where the return data is, that if P is zero, and i.e. so the data that we got back was false or zero which should happen because we're not allowed to do it where if we call the authorized upgrader this should return false so when we're checking the return data size remember because there is no return data size we can see that this return data size isn't actually zero but our return data is also not zero so because we don't pass this check as in there is no return data size this is false, meaning this and returns false, which means that we don't return, which then means that we return true. So this can call returns true because our contract doesn't exist. So going back to the authorizer upgrader, sorry, out uh, wallet deployer, we then pass this check, meaning we can transfer this meaning we can just call drop 43 times to get the 43 tokens. And there you go. We have the, con the whole challenge solved. So let's go ahead and paste that in. And let's go ahead and run this. No, we were so close. Attack authorizer is not defined. Did I forget to copy something? Oh shit. I pasted in the wrong thing. Shit. There we go. We run that and it sells. Cool. Thanks for watching and uh, catch you in the next one.